All right, we're going to be looking at rocks from the Stillwater complex that look a lot like this one. Notice how chalky white we see this surface is, which can be really useful for seeing a particular, uh, a particular uh, texture in this rock. However, we want to be looking at the fresh surface. Now, when it comes to understanding these ferromagnesian minerals, and identifying them, it's a huge challenge. And that's because previously you had examples that were nice and large like this, okay? Now, in spite of the color variation of these minerals, these are all pyroxenes. They all uh, make prismatic crystals that are rather short compared to what we'll see later for amphiboles and blocky they all have a similar crystal shape. And so this uh, property of habit or shape is really important because just as these are similar in these big crystals, it will be similar when we move to the thin sections. The other thing is uh, we see a really nice cleavage face here. Hopefully that is reflecting at you of this one single crystal, that is one single crystal, it takes a lot more effort to look for the cleavage faces in the smaller crystals, but it is equally important. So our plan now is to take a look at different kinds of pyroxenes in thin section. And I have here two different samples also from the Stillwater complex. Note they're on the LED panel and we have one polarizer. So this is a plain polarized view of these two samples. These are not the samples that you have in your lab, but similar to them. I'm now going to take the, the loop or the magnifying lens that has the polarizing film. So remember, Elliot showed us that if our arrow is to the side, we're still getting a PPL view. If I rotate it, it's going to be extinct because of the crossed polars. Now, this, is, this arrow is going to block your view, so I'm going to spin it around so that it's to the south. All right, I'm moving the loop directly over my sample, and I'm gonna show you an image in I find that sometimes I have to do a little focusing. Um, so you might, once you've got your loop in focus, you might tape it down. And I'm using my camera here to help me see what's going on. This is definitely a little tricky. So be patient with yourself and with this process. Okay. so. Here is the image of one of these samples, and I can use my smartphone to zoom in. Oops, <laughs> I can uh, to zoom in, and I can gently lift up and move over. So that I'm going to call this one sample uh, KSTL2. It is not the same as yours. Then I'm going to lift up, and I'm going to look at the sample. SC17. Okay, and we're going to be zooming in. We'll take a bit of a pause and we will transition to looking at the optical characteristics of each of these. Remember that when we're looking at samples, we also want to take a look at what they look like in plain polarized light. So here we're looking at the grayish high relief or moderate relief uh, minerals in this top sample closer uh, to the bottom of the screen. And we're looking at the minerals that are sort of pinkish brown and high relief in this one. Now, uh, I'm going to show you that this lower, the, this sample closer to me, you can see how we have these small interstitial minerals that have very strong pleochroism. That is not the pyroxene. But if we look at the minerals in this corner, we might see that this mineral, 
goes from a slightly pale gray to, as we rotate it, more of that pinkish brown color. It's a faint pleochroism, but we are going to learn that that is indicative of orthopyrexine. Whereas if we try the same experiment here, we're not getting a strong, uh, even a faint change in color. So PPL, take a look at the color, pleochroism, and relief. So now we're going to look at the same sample that showed the slight pleochroism, but we're going to look at it in crossed polarized light. I now have my sample in cross polarized light. This is the sample that showed the faint pleochroism. And I want to point out to you these grains. We're not looking at the interstitial bit. First of all, notice that we've got some really dark bits with jagged edges. Those are where the mineral was polished away. Those are holes created during the thin section making. I'm going to zoom in and focus on these two examples. OK, notice. How would you characterize the interference colors here? High third order, second order, or first order? OK, I've zoomed in here, and I'm looking at these very thin lines that are parallel to each other. They do not change in thickness, even though they do not penetrate through the whole crystal. These are cleavages seen in thin section. This is the same mineral that I showed you before that had the cleavage. Now we've turned our attention to this mineral, which also had a strong internal lineation. And what I've done is that now I, I picked up my lens and I rotated my thin section until the crystal was extinct. Remember the extinction? So what I'm trying to show you now is that when this mineral is aligned so that it's internal um, sense of lineation is north-south, just like my upper polarizer, I have parallel extinction. This part of the mineral is dark. This is one of the features of orthopyrexine. When we're looking at extinction and interference colors, this is going to be tricky for us because we ideally need to be able to hold on to the edge of our thin section and watch our thin section at the same time. With our microscope stage, this is very much easier. But perhaps you can see how I am changing the orientation of the thin section, and I'm seeing the orthopyrexine go from um, extinct to uh, no longer extinct. So the one that I was really looking at is this one. We see it has these uh, mo gray modeling that's showing us a linear fabric. And when we line that up north-south, the mineral is extinct. In other words, it is showing parallel extinction. Okay, now we're looking at the SC17 sample. And we can see that we have this mafic mineral in cross-polarized light. And one of the first things to notice is that there are examples of this mineral that are going beyond the first order interference colors. There are, in fact, examples that have low interference colors when this mineral is either close to uh, its, when it's close to one of its optical axes, if that's the slice we're looking at. But I want to think about this slice and think about what our interference colors are 
at the most, at the brightest end of the spectrum for this mineral. So how would you describe these interference colors? Next thing I want to take a look at is I'm noticing here that this mineral has its outer grain showing a slightly elongated shape. So now I want to pay attention to either how any internal uh, cleavages or its external uh, crystal shape is oriented as I move the mineral. So I'm going to try and show you. Boom. Boom. There it is. Notice how this mineral is now extinct. And yet, its external form is inclined. It's not lining up perfectly with my phone or the orientation of the polarizer. This is showing us the inclined extinction of clinopyroxene. Okay, hey, we're looking at two clinopyroxenes in sample SC17. Um, so we see the really nice interference colors in this case. Here, I wanna focus your attention on this smaller grain. Notice that it, within the smaller grain, we're seeing parallel bars, but these have a thickness to them. These cannot be cleavages because of their thickness and because we're going to see as I rotate this sample that they um, have a different set of properties to the main crystal. So I've now made this clinopyroxene be fully extinct. The outer part of the clinopyroxene is fully extinct here, whereas the inner part has these cross hatchings that are not extinct. The host pyroxene is inclined. It is a clinopyroxene. As I turn this pyroxene, it's a little bit hard to tell. Now, the internal bars are extinct, inclined the other direction. This is also pyroxene, but this is an area where the pyroxene is showing exolution lamellae. These bars within the host clinopyroxene are a different pyroxene that has exolved. And we're gonna take a look at how this comes to be.